Hi everyone, I'm Joey with Nick Nerdy Makes, and welcome back. My mom is still sick, so I'm filming in again today. These videos had to be filmed separately to work with schedules and time zones. Time to talk about using recycled materials and costuming. She met first with Shannon from Sam and from Sham Shannon Make and Amanda with Lost Princess Run. And thank you guys for joining. Yeah, glad to be here. Really excited to talk about some recycled material. Yes, I am so excited. So using recycled materials can be kind of daunting if you're not entirely certain what types of materials you should be using, whether you're sewing or making props. And here we've got two awesome people who are very passionate about recycling to be able to give their advice and their experiences with it. So let's get started. Also, I am joined here today by Boo. He is a giant baby that refuses to be left alone. So that is my lap warmer for the moment. Then she talked with Rachel from Lawbreaker Loose and Caitlin, Caitlin Bauer. All right, here we are in a different location because, you know, tech issues. Today I am here with Rachel from Lawbreaker Loose and Caitlin Bauer. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Shannon, what got you into using recycled materials in your work and in costuming? Um, well, I definitely think that it came originally from a bit of a sense of sticker shock. <laughs> I grew up always, <laughs> yeah, I grew up uh, always doing all of my shopping secondhand at like thrift stores and stuff. So my that's just what I was used to. And I think um, I've always kind of just had that sense of being thrifty and um, trying to save a bit of money here and there. And so it just was kind of a very natural segue I feel just going from buying clothes secondhand to finding other ways of getting secondhand materials and carrying it out of my wardrobe and sort of into other aspects of my life definitely yeah I think the the cost aspect is something that's huge and it helps you kind of get creative especially if you can't afford to buy the things that you want, like the new pretty fabric, and you got to kind of get creative with what you've got on hand. That's definitely a big factor. <laughs> How about you, Amanda? What uh, kind of got you into recycling and using the recycled materials in your costuming? Honestly, kind of similar reasons. Um, I'm cheap with my costumes. I don't have a lot of money to spend on them out of my regular budget, and buying bed sheets and random things at the thrift store is just a lot less than whatever you can buy brand new. And I also bought a lot of stuff at the thrift store growing up. Um, so like, it's just someplace I like to go. Like I went to the thrift store today just to poke around, came home with a shirt that had pizzas on it. Like you never know what you're going to find. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. I know it's exciting. <laughs> he just licked my teeth, bro. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think the thrift store thing is definitely helpful, especially when you're trying to find a way to integrate the ideas you've got in your head. And for me, I like I let the materials speak to me. So I let them tell me what they want to become based on the colors or the pattern or the shape or, you know, other uses that could be for I frequently work with plastics, there's certain plastics that work better for one than the other. And I think that I don't like waste. That's one of my biggest things. And being able to use every bit of a project, like even just the little bits that I trim off of scenes, it just, it makes it perfect. I also yeah, I find the good. size of the thing you get from the thrift store dictates what you can make with it. Cause I bought yeah. a bed sheet recently that I looked at it and thought, oh, this would make a great ball gown. And then I looked at how much of it there was and thought, hmm, it better be a Regency ball gown. Cause that's as much as I can get out of it. <laughs> You can't exactly go buy another matching one because there was only one, so. I think that's one of the really interesting ways that recycling sort of shapes the way that you make stuff. Um, I know that that was one of the questions that was asked for the 21 questions was, do you pick a project and then get materials or do you buy material? Um, do you, you know, in what order are you doing your making? And I think that for us, if we're recycling things, I think it's a really common approach that 
it's less that you head into a project with a really rigid idea of what exactly you want to make. I think it's, I think for a lot of us, and you guys can agree or disagree, but I think I at least head into a project with sort of like a framework, a general idea of maybe what I want to do, but then it's kind of down to like, what can I find? And how can I sort of take my idea and like adapt it to the materials that I've found? Or sometimes I just don't even have an idea. Like sometimes I literally actually stumble across something on the side of the road and see it instantly. It's like, okay, this is super cool. I have to do something with it. I'm not sure what, but I just, I have to do something with it. So I think it's a really cool way that it recycling informs the creative process and kind of shifts the order of things around. Yeah, for sure, because the second you make too many specific choices, you're never going to find that, and now you have to go to the store and buy new fabric because you couldn't find exactly what you were looking for. But if you think, oh, I just want to make a 1860s dress, you can just find fabric and then decide what style to make with it. But if I say, oh, I want a blue paisley dress with this specific trim on it, well, now where am I going to find that? So... <laughs> I kind of like that about the process where you let the project speak to you because it, you get to come up with something so truly unique that no one else will have this. And, you know, I think, I know I've talked with Shannon about this before. I know we've both done our fair share of dumpster diving. So <laughs> yes. it's, it's always interesting to see the potential too, that I don't feel like a lot of other people see it, but I look at something that's dirty and covered in dust and, you know, I'm like, you know, this would be a really cool thing. Yeah, just <laughs> And you're never going to show up resource. somewhere and have the same dress as somebody else because what are the chances they bought the same exact item at a thrift store that you found and turned it into the same other kind of thing? <laughs> so it's totally unique and people always go, wow, where'd you get that? I'm like, I paid $6 for this dress. Yeah. I think that's definitely part of the appeal too is like the bragging rights like oh that's really cool you're like yeah that used to be a sofa <laughs> you know and now it's like a dress <laughs> oh my god sofa dress is on my list I, I I don't know if uh any you guys or anybody else has seen the Kara Tours uh her videos correct oh, me yes yeah, she made an entire dress out of a sofa that she found on the side of the road. I was like, you know what? Goals. That, that I've done is. sofa coats at a very small regional theater once. We had a big roll of upholstery fabric that was clearly only ever intended to go on furniture and put a couple poor actors in full coats of them in the summer under stage lights because we didn't have money to buy anything else. And that's just what was in the back room. They were good sports about it, but, uh, yeah, sofa coats. <laughs> well, at least oh, it has awesome. a whole roll, too, though. Like, I have, uh, I have a whole Ikea sofa broken down. It's, like, all washed and seam ripped and everything, and I measured it, and it's 15 yards of fabric, but, you know, the largest piece is, like, you know, a meter and a half by a meter and a half. <laughs> so it's going to take some interesting piecing, for sure. Sounds like a ruffled petticoat. Lots of long strips. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Rachel, how did you first get interested in recycling? My, okay, this goes back to like the 70s and the whole ecology movement that my dad got really caught up in that because I think at the time he was working for um, Eastman Kodak factory and they were producing a lot of pollution in the area where we live. And so sort of to counterbalance the fact that he knew his employer was completely destroying the environment, he got really involved in recycling. So, I mean, I was a, a baby, a, a toddler, young child when he was getting into this. Um, but so I was just sort of raised with that kind of sensibility. We always saved things even before there was municipal recycling he would save stuff and like drive it to another state to turn it in or whatever so oh that's fantastic how about you caitlin how did you first get your start in recycling so mine was a kind of practical i didn't grow up in the most affluent family and so it really was by, by necessity, we had to save things and reuse them. And from there, it kind of turned into 
I became more aware of the ecological ramifications of if I didn't. Right. So it was it, it started practical, and then you just kind of learn more and more and more, and it keeps going. Oh, that's fantastic to hear. I, I'm also very passionate about it, so it's always great to be around other people who are just as passionate about it as you. So We all have reusable water bottles. <laughs> oh, I don't right now. <laughs> but I do. So, so I recycle. Uh, I, I have, I basic, I've worked with a lot of plastic. That is mainly what I work with. And so I recycle it myself. I process, I shred, and I turn it into new things. So I typically so don't cool. work with a lot of PET. Um, it's very complicated. PET is the pop bottles, the clear stuff. It's the widely, the most widely recycled plastic in the world, which is nice, but there's a lot of facilities that have uh, specialized equipment. It needs to be in an oxygen free and high pressure environment. And I don't have that kind of equipment. So typically most of what I save personally are the, the bottle tops, which is polypropylene plastic. So I use, use those a lot, but anyway, plastic nerdery aside. <laughs> All right, so Kayla, what is your favorite way to recycle? My favorite way to recycle? Um, you know, plastic. That is a really, really tough material to work with. Um, a lot of what I do is I take recycled plastics, and then I take them from the point that people get rid of them, and because we don't have a good recycling facility here. So I've been taking it upon myself to deliver what I can't recycle myself to other facilities, but then I'll take like milk jugs, for example, and delabel, shred them, and then melt and compress them into new shapes. And I really love that, like I did, I'll put a picture of it up here, but I did a tile uh, made of all recycled plastic that looks just like marble. Like, or, or is it granite or marble? I don't know, an expensive countertop I can't afford. So <laughs> I was... I would really love to compress like full sheets of that and make like replacement countertops, you know, if I ever decide to upgrade to the equipment necessary to do something like that. But I think plastic, there is just such potential. I know I'm, I'm kind of in the testing phase of doing like recycled plastic boning. So HDPE plastic number two, the same stuff that's in milk jugs, it's very flexible even after it's been remelted. So I think it would be good to experiment with that for boning for corsets or just, you know, dresses just to give them a little more structure and rigidity. And so I think plastic it's definitely probably my favorite material overall to work with in the recycling realm. That's a super cool idea. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah. If anybody has ideas, like drop them in the comments or if you guys have ideas, just send them to me in a message and I will do my best. And fun. give her a shout out if you would like to buy some plastic <laughs> that is recycled and environmentally friendly. Because when she told me about that idea the first time, I was like, I think there are a lot of people out there. I know there's actually plenty of people that have commented on my videos saying like, hey, I'd really like to make a corset, but um, do you think it would work with, say, reed or caning instead of plastic? Because I really don't want to use more plastic. So honestly, if you guys out there watching this would like to use and buy some recycled boning, I encourage you to give Kayla some encouragement and uh, you know, write a little <laughs> comment down there. Let's see. If we and then you can tell all your friends you have milk jugs in your corset. <laughs> You've got milk jugs supporting your jugs. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, that that'll be uh, the the name that like if I like patent it or something. Milk jugs. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I love it. Amazing. <laughs> Caitlin, what is your favorite way to recycle? So you know, it's it's one of the easiest, but reusing things that you know it's. Reduce, reuse, recycle, right? Mm -hmm. That that really is where I find I can make the most impact just in our life. Um, we also, you know, we do our pickup stuff where the city comes and takes things, but that's that doesn't seem as visceral and impactful on our life. Yeah, that's understandable. I like that you brought that up, though, because I've seen a couple of different ones, like on online sources, where it's reduce, reuse, recycle, and that's the method that you're supposed to go in. But I've also seen ones that it's reduce, reuse, repurpose, recycle. Yes. Reuse and repurpose, to me, kind of mean the same thing. Yes. But... They, they, they very much go hand in hand, especially when kind of, I guess, my brand is 
doing things cheaply, so oftentimes I'm sourcing what I make from things I've either already made or from my that I have from myself, from our bed sheets or things I get at a thrift store. So reuse, repurpose. They, they they are very interlinked for me. Absolutely. How about you, Rachel? Well, I I think the one of the hugest ways in which I am applicable to this panel as a panelist is that my job is to work in a theater costume shop at a regional theater. And the whole nature of theatrical costuming is to prioritize the repurposing and the reusing of things that already exist. Or you go buy something and you remake it into what you need it to be. Or you pull something out of stock and you remake it into what it needs to be this time around. Like the whole nature. Below Broadway, the whole nature of theatrical production is use everything you possibly can before you buy something. Absolutely. And that's important for maintaining a budget and maintaining a realistic expectation for the show. So, yeah, right. the local theater budgets are not the biggest. So this next question is a little bit controversial. Um, what, uh, what part of fabric and textile production do you guys think has made the biggest impact on the environment? I don't know that there's really one singular answer to this question because I feel like I know some people will say that polyester fabrics is the worst impact to the environment because of the waste produced as a result because of fast fashion. You know, people just throw things away and then it ends up in a landfill. But then you have another group of people that are trying to talk about water conservation within dyeing and with all the fields of flax that are getting spun into linen. And so, you know, you'll get some people that say, oh, you should only use natural fibers, and then you get some people that are, you know, on a different end of the spectrum. So I don't know that there's really one answer to this. It's just all about you as a person and what you decide is the most important to you in terms of environmental impact. I feel like another thing that's made a big impact is just the quality of textiles that we have now. Like, you go back a couple hundred years, like they would take an 18th century dress, remodel it into a different 18th century dress, remodel it into a Regency dress because the fabric lasted. If I buy a t-shirt at Walmart three months later, it's got holes in it. Like, even if you want to hang on to things a long time, it's really hard to find higher quality fabric that isn't, you know, really crappy and made quickly and cheaply. And that's the other part of the problem is that they're made to just fall apart. So you have to buy more, which is just garbage. Yeah. You know, there is another end of the spectrum though with that too. I feel like that's also made it a little more accessible for people to be able to purchase clothing and not pay an arm and a leg. You know, it's, for in terms of accessibility anyway, because I know I own probably a handful of $5 Walmart tank tops and, you know, obviously they don't last the longest, but, you know, learning how to mend and I know there's several items of clothing that I have like um, basically put a lining in just to give it some structural, structural help. But I mean, I suppose it all depends on the person. Yes, I know. I mean, about clothes costing an arm and a leg, like, they used to, like, nobody, I wouldn't say nobody, most people these days, like, don't understand how expensive clothes used to be. So when they look at something that's 20 or $30, they go, oh my god, that's so expensive. I'm like, it's really not. But when you're used to seeing a $4 Walmart t-shirt, you know, a $20 shirt somewhere else seems crazy, but it's really not. Even that's probably too cheap for what it really is. So I think people just don't value their clothing as much as they could. Just because the price tags are so low, like they shouldn't be quite as low as they are in places. Because you know if a t-shirt is $4 that whoever sewed it probably didn't get paid much. So. Yeah, that and the, the, the throwaway mentality, that's been that's been big lately as far as, you know, just wear it until it starts to fall apart and get holes and then you just toss it and get a new one because it's just easy to just buy a new one instead of 
repairing what you already have. Or even really, I mean, honestly, the mentality was more, you know, a stitch in time saves nine, right? Like it was to catch the hole or the the repair to be before it became a big task, you know, and it was just sort of more of a more of a part of everyday life that you would be aware of the state of your clothing and kind of try to keep a little bit more on top of the repairs as you go, as opposed to, yeah, just letting that hole get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, well, let's just get a new one. Well, I know very few people who repair their clothes regularly because most people go, oh, it's got a hole in it, get rid of it. Like a lot of people don't even know how to sew, so they don't bother, they don't think about that they could fix it because it's not something that is taught in school or really valued right now. You know, it used to be a huge thing that you had to take care of your very expensive clothes, and now that they're so cheap, people just don't bother because they don't have to. Mm hmm Oh, that drives me nuts whenever my, my husband will ask me to fix his jeans, you know, if he's got rips or holes and stuff, and he'll bring it to me just so destroyed. And you know, if you had brought this to me, just ignoring the hole... If you brought this to me when it first happened, I could have fixed it in 2.5 seconds. Yeah. <laughs> I have to spend like half an hour putting a, putting a giant patch into it. So, <laughs> so Rachel, what sort of uh, textile or practice do you think has made the biggest impact on waste? In terms of creating more of it or reducing it? it why not both? Wow. I, I'm going to have to think about that. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, actually, no. You Let me a... say, um, I think that um, it, it's kind of a dichotomy. I was uh, The first thing that occurs to me is digital printing of custom prints on textiles. And I, I'm here in North Carolina where spoon flour is right up the street from my house, pretty much. And um, I know they've really prioritized adding a lot of ecologically sound, recycled and repurposed fabrics. Um, and then you just print exactly how much you need within a yard. You know, you can't, you can't print by the quarter yard or whatever, but you can print just the five yard length you need instead of buying a bolt or someone somewhere produces a bolt of 25 yards or a run of 10,000 yards of that design or whatever. Um, I think that's a kind of a game changer in the, the broad sense and in the micro sense, the fact that you can't fine tune portions of yardages is wasteful. Um, but in the scheme of things like a wastage of a half a yard is not a wastage of the 8,000 yards we didn't sell, so we've got to scrap it and recycle it or throw it in the landfill. Absolutely. I do think customized digital game, t customized digital printing is a game changer when it comes to reducing industrial waste and factory production waste, just because a small run is a, a small run. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and that's, that's a big problem with when we're talking about these things. It's, of, of course we should, doing what we can at a small level, but we also have to think about the industrial practices and hack everything because that's really where a big chunk comes from. And that mean that doesn't mean, you know, we shouldn't do our part, but it, it's also important that we're looking at that too. So I, I never would have thought of that. That's really fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, actually, uh, Rachel, you posted a video once too that I thought was uh, really pertinent to this point is uh, water usage. Um, yes, water conservation is huge. For me, I mean, behind me, that there's a door over here that leads to the dye room that I, I think in that video, I mentioned the fact that one custom dye job of like, say, for example, 10 yards of fabric for a period gown. I, I did the math on it, and, and if, the, if they get really anal about color correction and I have to do two or three processes, we're getting into the hundreds of gallons of waters that get of water that gets used just to make that one color change, mm -hmm. you know. And and I think bringing that awareness to a designer of like, if you buy this the wrong color, thinking, well, we'll just dye it, 
you're thinking we're going to pour hundreds of gallons of water down the drain for this. Which, it, you know, far be it for me to say whether it's worth it or not, because it, the it, whole design project of concept and the stage picture and all that is beyond my pay grade, as it were. But, you know, I, I, I always feel a little bit of guilt when I have to do one of those big processes. And so I spend a lot of time thinking about where conservation could happen. And I'm convinced that it actually comes from the top with educating the design team and the creative team at the theater, the artistic leadership as to what these kinds of choices, what their implications are. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think like she was saying, it comes with education. So as people, the general public becomes more aware of the practices and how they affect the environment, it's people are looking more towards things like bamboo and seaweed and alternate leathers. And so as, as the general public becomes more aware, there becomes a market. And of course, that's very money fueled way to think about it, but that makes the people who are making the products care. Right. So it's working. Because if that bottom line is, is the amount of money you can make by reducing the waste and reducing the amount of money you're spending taking care of it, I think that's kind of a beneficial side for everybody. And, you know, it's a little more work sometimes, but that's unfortunately the cost. Definitely. That, needs to be a that speaks to, that speaks to one of my ideas that I, I've pitched it to the leadership here. I, I think they're still sort of ruminating on it, but taking the concept of carbon offsets and, and buying carbon credits, if you know that your industry is going to, to use a lot, um, I, I propose the idea of taking that and, and turning it into water offset credits for designers that it's like, you you can do this many custom dye jobs for a, a show, and after that, it comes out of your budget. X number of dollars for every overage, and those dollars will be donated to water conservation efforts in the local area here. Um, which, when I pitched that to the leadership, they were conceptually really into it, but I don't know if they're really gonna go for it because it's a big ask. Yeah, that's that's definitely a one that struggles. <laughs> Just kind of pitching it to the higher ups and hoping that they that they're on the same page as you. So, yeah, it's a, it's a good concept. I'll use that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and I think too that a lot of people that tend to focus on it are people that don't. Like if me, for example, I worry about the little amounts of plastic I'm able to save, I'm able to fix, but I went to a recycling facility because I was working on a project where I needed a lot of one specific kind of plastic. And so I went to this facility and they have these tubes of PET with an LDPE cap, and I was looking for the LDPE, and they were throwing them away box by box and as much as they could fit in the dumpster at a time because they had 25,000 pounds of it in that warehouse that they can't recycle because when they put it through the shredder, so they're tubes from a medical facility that have an anticoagulant in the, in the bottom for, for blood. And so when it goes through the shredder, it just gums up and gets all over the shredder. And so it's, it's not worth their time, I suppose, would be the right thing to say as far as cleaning it and finding a way to man to make that happen and I'm frozen <laughs> yay technology <laughs> um but yeah I think uh I think a lot of people get really concerned with their small area and their small corner but there's usually a bigger picture where it's like you know you don't have to feel bad if you can't do it all of the time I'm not saying that you shouldn't care but I don't think you should be so hard on yourself or, you know, unfortunately, sometimes in some cases, hard on other people, too, so. <laughs> I saw this Im image that really resonated with me, and it was like, there's one person taking little steps and getting higher and higher, and there's one person trying to reach all the way to the top, but trying to do it in one step, so of course they're not making it. Absolutely, that's a great way to look at it. 
So let me ask you guys this. What are some ways that you think that some small ways that people can start to reduce waste in making costumes? Because, you know, as we all know, making things makes waste. You know, it happens. <laughs> um, I would say for me that uh, the, the biggest or the, maybe the preliminary step that goes into this on my part, at least, is cutting layouts, like looking at mm -hmm. how I'm arranging my pattern pieces so as to take, you know, take into account, of course, the main line and what's going to work, but what's going to be most efficient. Like, uh, I really enjoy sort of the Tetris of arranging things. And often um, I'll have so I'll actually cut out maybe all of my pattern pieces and lay them down and like spend time trying to shifting them around to see what the most efficient way is that I can get everything all laid out. Um, and of course, knowing where you can cheat on grain line really helps with that because there are definitely some mm -hmm. pieces that need to be kept on a grain line as much as possible. And there's some where it can be shifted, you know, slightly and it would be fine or it can be shifted, but then you know you have to interface it to stabilize it or something. Um, so I would say for me, the first step in trying to reduce my waste is just goes into uh, using the fabric as efficiently as possible. Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me is just to make less things, I guess, like instead of... I, I know, but like I know a lot of people who like want to have a new outfit for every single event they go to, and I'm a big fan of re-wearing things. I have a couple of dresses, like I just started doing this, I think about a year before everything shut down, so I'm not, I haven't been doing this forever, but when I started I wore the same two dresses that I'd made to every other event because I didn't have anything else, but also I wasn't buying more fabric and wasting more fabric scraps and things, constantly making new stuff every single time I had to go somewhere. And I kind of love it because the more you wear something, even if it's historical, the more it feels like it's your clothes and not a costume, which I really yeah. love. Um, yeah. Yeah. And again, like using recycled material, like I love using bed sheets and curtains and stuff to make whatever I can because it, it costs less and it saves on buying new fabric. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think that's a big one for me is just trying to, so I go to a lot of estate sales. That's typically where I get a lot of my fabric is because usually at estate sales, they have like a big box of sheets that nobody's going to buy it. So they'll just throw it in the dumpster behind. Or the, grandma's the giant sale. stash of sewing supplies. No one wanted. Yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, there's so much fat. I need to start destashing myself. Um, and I think another big one for me too is I like to use every scrap that I can out of it. So I, like Shannon said, I make sure that I pay attention to my layout because pattern matching, what is that? I don't know. Um, and then taking like the little bits and the ends and like all the selvages that I cut off and I keep, I have like a big cabbage patch that I keep all of the really little scraps in and I'm ready to use them. I'll just cut them up and so turn the cabbage into coleslaw and you have the little bits and they're great for stuffing. So if I make a doll for my daughter or a, some kind of stuffed animal or, you know, a bum pad, like if you're going to be using, uh, you know, a big booty maker. <laughs> well, I don't even know what you'd call that. What is that? Can you? Like, um, I think it's just called a, a, I call it, I call it a butt pad, but I know that's not what you call it. A rump? I think a rump, a false yeah. rump, right? Yeah. False okay. <laughs> Victorian era is not my, my area of specialty. So, <laughs> but yeah, I think that that's a, a good way to reuse and, and kind, kind of uh, minimize the amount of waste you're going through because at that point, it doesn't really matter what the fiber content is in there. And, you know, it helps get you the floof that you need without having to go buy a bag of the polyfill. I also love using leftover bits to make, like, accessories. Like, I can make a matching reticule or I can add a little self-trim or something or save it. Like, save pieces of your scraps for later in case, you know, whoops, I gained a few pounds and now it doesn't quite fit. And you can just cut a little extra panel and stick it in there and now your dress fits again and it still matches. I did that to one of my dresses I made in college because I was skinny in college and I'm not as skinny now. And if I hadn't saved that little scrap, I would have had to get rid of that dress that I spent 30 hours embroidering. So, 
like that was really exciting that I found that tiny scrap I hung on to for no good reason. <laughs> and like what you were saying too about not making you know, a new outfit for every event. It's also thinking of creative ways to make your outfit do double duty, you know? So like at the moment I'm like currently working on my, my sofa outfit, which is going to be a um, historical Hogwarts, but I wanted to design it in a way that it could be not necessarily, it doesn't need to scream Gryffindor either. Like I want to be able to wear it to just any old 1890s event and you know, have accessories that can be, you know, switched in and out so that the one outfit, one base outfit can fill multiple roles. So instead of needing three different outfits, you know, I could be a biking outfit and a normal 1890s outfit and a cosplay for, you know, Hogwarts, like all these different things. I think that kind of ties into what you were saying about, you know, doesn't need a million different outfits. Accessories are an awesome way to recycle your outfit because it makes it feel different. Like every time I've worn the same dress, I accessorize it differently and it still feels new and exciting even though it's the same dress or wear a different skirt with the same blouse or something. Like lots of mixing and matching is really helpful. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that I really enjoy doing is being able to, like Shanna was saying, make an outfit do multiple things. You know, I'm working on a historically accurate Disney costume, but I also wanted it to be able to be something that I could wear to the SCA. So, yes, hello. So that's that's one of those things that it's not that I'm, you know, part of it's kind of lazy because I don't want to have to make another costume, but it's being able to take and make the costume fit multiple either time periods or multiple purposes as far as yes i'd like to have it for historically accurate disney to be able to participate in that event but i'd also like this to be something that i actually wear because i think that a lot of people do have several items in their closet that you know they'll make it for <laughs> bless you uh they'll make it for youtube or they'll make it for an event and then that's it they wear it once for the instagram photos and then they stash it away in their closet and never wear it again so i think having a multi-purpose item is huge i admit i have a few of those in my closet right now but in my defense i've had one event <laughs> in the last year and a half so. oh that's true yeah that makes it really difficult but once i have somewhere to wear those i will 100 percent pull them out of the closet <laughs> yes definitely I'm glad that things are kind of opening back up again tentatively and people are starting to get back out into doing fun events and being able to do all the things that we haven't been doing the last 18 months. So it's hopefully uh, all the, the new exciting costumes that people haven't had a chance to wear yet are going to come out and see some new ideas. Caitlin, what do you think are some small ways that people can reduce waste in their everyday lives? Oh boy. Um, specifically for fabric, I know I can't remember which day, but you have your video coming out about fixing fashion. I think just learning little things like that is really important. Um, how to kind of take care of things like that in house instead of just getting rid of things. I think that's the easiest way. I, I don't have much more beyond that without getting in, into a deep dive. I think changing your mindset from uh, prioritizing brand new clothing to shopping secondhand is huge. I was thinking about it this morning as, as I'm thinking about the fact that this panel was coming up and I realized that I've only bought two new pieces of clothes in the past two years. Um, Super cool. And, and, because of the pandemic, I had to completely replace parts of my wardrobe because I stopped moving and I gained 30 pounds. So, you know, like suddenly pre-pandemic clothes don't even fit. So I need to have more that fit post-COVID me. Uh, but they all came from ThreadUp and, and other secondhand vendors. Um, I only bought new things from one specific designer that I like to support that's a small clothing company. Um, and I think I, I've been, that's another thing I've been sort of not agitating, but gently suggesting here at the theater is that when we do 
uh, contemporary shows, those are often the shows where we buy the most and have the most wastage, where you buy things, you buy five shirts, you two of them fit the actor and the designer likes them, and you, then you're only able to return one of them because the other two are past the return window. You know, we, we acquire so much contemporary clothes when we do shows set in the modern time. And I've been advocating for setting up a, an arrangement with ThreadUp and Poshmark and these other resale companies because it, it's, it's kind of a resource that you could turn back into capital by turning it into these companies and getting credit to buy new to us secondhand clothes. Absolutely. That's, that's a great thought. And I really, really, I love that idea. So what is the weirdest thing that you guys have ever recycled? I know this is not a short list for me, so. <laughs> uh, definitely my weirdest thing is uh, the bodice for my mermaid dress I made last year because I pulled a bunch of fabric out of my stash, thought it was all just pieces of pink fabric, and picked up one and said this is the perfect thing for my bodice, and it was a dress and not a piece of fabric. So I spent three hours seam ripping the entire thing so that I could lay out all of my pieces very carefully, like extreme pattern Tetris, and yeah, uh, yeah. just just cut it all out while skimping on seam allowance and made it happen. <laughs> yes. I also once used fabric I literally took off of somebody's garbage pile, like a full roll of like 30 yards of fabric on their garbage. What? I just took it home and <laughs> made stuff out of it. Yeah. I would have oh my gosh my boyfriend was like what are you doing that's somebody's garbage I'm like I don't care it's mine now <laughs> oh yeah see, see my partner is a total enabler he'll just jump right in the dumpster with me so it's perfect <laughs> oh gosh mine is not uh, an enabler he's like why are you bringing home more stuff just don't ask questions just you'll, there's a vision you'll see it eventually <laughs> what's the weirdest thing you recycled Shannon um, well, besides the sofa dress, which is, you know, still very much in the, in the works right now, um, I actually think I'm really new to historical costuming, so I don't have a really long list of costumes or fabric that has been recycled, but, um, I do do a ton of, like, furniture upcycles, and I think the, the coolest thing that I've upcycled in sort of that area was um, I would I went around Montreal and collecting a bunch of drawers from furniture that was like too far destroyed to be salvaged. Um, but if the drawers were still in good shape, I just went around collecting drawers and then I built a dresser that just had all of these different drawers in it. I think it was like maybe nine or 10 different drawers and they were all different sizes and shapes. And then I like built the frame and uh, even the runners were repurposed and um, it was a headache. It was a total nightmare to build that frame, but it <laughs> looks super cool after. Yeah, there, there's, here, I'll put a picture of it right here. It's yeah, awesome. it was it's probably one of the coolest upcycles I've ever seen and the most creative. Aww. Is it's, <laughs> Thank you. I see people like repurpose dressers and stuff. They'll just, you know, sand them down, repaint them or kind of remake them and do a different thing. But that takes it to a whole new level because it was several pieces of furniture that otherwise all of them would have been thrown away. But you were able to give it that character with the different knobs and the different size drawers. And I think that it was just such a wonderful use. I, just, I love it. it it's, it's unique. And what about you? What is your uh, most strange, uh, unique upcycle or recycle? Oh, boy. Um, I don't know that I have. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know that I have one in particular that's. Oh, gosh, everything I do is so, so strange. I mean, I don't know. I think that there's just so, so many weird things <laughs> that I do. I don't know that there's just one in particular that really stands out i know i know shannon you probably saw the luthien gown where i took the tin can or the so was tin cans aren't actually tin anymore they're steel fun fact uh like soup cans and things like that and i hammered them out flat on my anvil and uh cut them into flowers and gave them with that nice textured look with the ball peen hammer and then sewed them all over the back of the gown and Oh gosh, there's so many like 
Daenerys? Didn't you do the whole the throne? Oh yeah, the Iron Throne. Um, that one was all pretty much recycled paper. Uh, that I mixed with a few other things to get that structural durability and that that was probably my my favorite and most involved project i've ever done that one took me nine months to texture all of the swords onto there and oh gosh it was oh God, i i don't remember i know i wrote it down somewhere but you know disorganized hectic life i set it down somewhere but i recycled hundreds of pounds of newspaper to make that and you could drop a car on that thing and nothing would happen to it it's it's that was definitely labor intensive, but I don't know. I think uh, in, in terms of costuming, because I, I feel kind of in the same boat as you, where it's like a lot of my stuff that I use, most of my recycled materials in tends to be prop related more rather than costuming. But I know that there's pieces of fabric that I've dove into dumpsters for and ones that I've turned around to repurpose. And I know there's one I'm working on coming up soon that where I take lots of tiny little scraps and basically make like a kaleidoscope. I don't know if you've seen like the scrap quilts or the crumb quilts. Yeah, like crazy quilts? Connect. Yeah, like where you connect lots of little pieces of fabric together and I'm making full panels of fabric out of that to make a full gown. So is my goal and I'm, I'm going to talk about it now. I've been wanting to keep the secret, but I'm going to talk about it now because I want to hold myself actually accountable for making it. And I'm making an entire Victorian ensemble out of trash. That's that's just my overall reaching goal is things that would have otherwise been thrown away. So I look I forward to seeing that someday. <laughs> that sounds cool. <laughs> it'll be a while, but I think it'll be fun. Uh, I'm just in the last day or two of uh, making Bilbo's robe from The Hobbit, which is basically a patchwork. It's an entire like house coat, but it's a patchwork quilt, and I made it all from recycled fabric, both from my stash, but also from the community. Like I went around my community and asked people if they had fabric or old clothes that they were going to throw out, and so I repurposed that. And um, I think the biggest uh, square in it is like maybe about this big. It's like maybe it's five centimeters by seven centimeters. So it's like it's quite a process, and it's really an interesting challenge to work with like a ton of different fabrics because I've got like quilting fabric from people making masks, but I've also got some women's corduroy jeans and I've got some like stretch velvet from some woman's leotard. She made her daughter and it's like putting all of these and like old knit sweaters, which are super bulky. So it's like sewing all of those things together in like really tiny amounts with like different seam allowances. Oh, it's like a nightmare. It was such a challenge, but it's like oh, super yeah. cool to see it come together and it's gorgeous. And the Hobbit colors are just on point. It's really, it's going to be really cool. It's really cool to get your whole community involved with that too. Yeah. It sure was they're like, all excited to see it when you're done. <laughs> yeah. Some it's woman good. offered me like this coat. She was like, I got it in Nepal 20 years ago and it's all wool and it's falling apart. And I haven't worn it in a decade because it's like, it's trashed, but I can't part with it because of the memories, but I would love to have it be part of your house coat and I was like I don't know if I can bring myself to cut it apart you know is the this is making me part. think of um a couple of years ago my boyfriend's really into like post-apocalyptic style and I made him a vest out of the swatches from the swatch bin in college because we just had, like, every time somebody went out shopping for one of our theater shows, like, they'd bring back lots of swatches and try to decide what they wanted. And we kept them in a box so people could sort through them and look for ideas. And it was just this giant box of just little swatches. And I sewed a bunch of them together and cut out vest pieces and made a vest out of it, which was super fun. But also none of the pieces were more That's than, like, this big. <laughs> what is the weirdest thing that you've recycled? This was a fun one for me. <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is four identical flower pots that we bought them because I needed to block felt on them to create this collection of four hats for a character who had successively more elaborate hats that the base was all the same. Um, I don't know if you know the show, the vibrator play where about the invention of the vibrator in the 19th century. No. Maybe this is okay. So 
maybe this is not safe for work or not safe <laughs> for YouTube or whatever. So warning, I'm about to talk about vibrators. Um, the play by Sarah Rule is, a, is about women awakening uh, to what's, what passed for feminism at the end of the 19th century and, and how their, their ignorance of their own bodies and, and the, the medical establishment's ignorance of women's bodies didn't really understand what vibrators were. You know, they thought they were a therapeutic device to improve people's mood. Well, yes, okay, they are, but, you know, <laughs> anyway, it's this whole video, or rather, it's this, it's this whole play where one character is, is having trouble in her marriage and is sent to a psychiatrist who is using this vibrate, or teaching her to use this vibrator, and they don't think it's sexual at all, but she progressively, the more she is treated, she becomes more and more open and free and her relationship becomes better and her self-confidence becomes in better. This is a long digression to get to the fact that the designer's concept was every time you saw her, she had this, what was obviously the same basic hat shape on, but with more elaborate trim. So like in the first one, is very reserved and she has just a tiny little piece of ribbon and by the end of it she has a cloud of butterflies shooting out of this hat okay <laughs> so i had to make four of this hat blocked on these flower pots because that was the shape that the designer wanted then i had these four flower pots uh, that we had purchased to be makeshift hat blocks as part of this production um and one of my co-workers breeds plants of those sorts of like self-reproducing plants like spider plants mm -hmm. and jade plants where you just break off a part of it and you have a whole new plant and so we reused the hat blocks flower pots from the vibrator play to give people plants from his plant progeny <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> that was an long story that was an absolutely fabulous story I love it. <laughs> and yeah, the flower pots are great because if you turn them upside down, they make perfect hats. Why not? I mean, there's this point in the 1870s, I think it is, where it really does look like you have a flower pot on your head. And that was that was the design of the basic hat. It's like the miniature hat block, the miniature hat flower pot hat. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Rachel had to go off and take care of some work and, you know, normal life stuff. So uh, we've just <laughs> so yeah we've just got caitlin here now <laughs> but uh so we wanted to make sure that rachel got her questions answered first but now i'd like to take it back uh so what is the weirdest thing you have recycled so actually like rachel mine is in the theater world um the weirdest thing I was doing a production of you're in town the musical which it's overall the weirdest show I've ever done. If you don't know anything about it, look no. it up. It's it's interesting, and it's also kind of ironic that we were talking earlier about water waste because it, it is related to that. It's it's not you're in town, it's you're in town. So it's <laughs> that kind of gives you a hint that it's an interesting show. Right. But I wish I could take credit for this. The, the, the props manager came up with the idea, so I can't. Um, we went to a local kombucha company, and we took the the big containers for, I, I don't know if it's for storing or moving or, or what they are, but they're these big old containers with this round thing at the top. My guess is to release pressure, based on what little bit I know about brewing anything. Mm -hmm. And we turned them into canisters for holding human waste <laughs> so that it could be recycled, actually. So it's, it's a very um, recycled things to pretend to be other things that would be recycled. I... So is it just water with yellow dye in it? Is that... They, they were brown, and then, yeah, we filled them up with water, and we, we put... 
a wrap on them oh. with the, the big danger logo and yeah but that that whole show overall is contains the weirdest things that I've ever recycled. I, I did a lot of recycling for that show because it's like this this dystopian waste world and there's very poor people. And so, of course, I recycled most of that because it all needed to look used. And then there's also very rich people. So the way we conceptualized that was kind of like a Hunger Games, Wizard of Oz feel where it was just out there and different. So I, I did a lot of taking things that have no right to look the way they are and changing them into other things. So it was overall, I, ju I could just say that whole show was the weirdest thing I've ever recycled. <laughs> that is awesome. I think another thing that's interesting too is something that you said, Shannon, um, for, for ways that people can help reduce waste in their own costuming and stuff those buy sell nothing groups that's not a thing where i'm at so i was deeply interested to hear about that because you're in a bigger city i'm i'm definitely out in the country and that's i, I think there might be a very small group <laughs> i think there might be a very small group locally um since you did mention that a couple of weeks ago and i looked it up and i think there might be one i don't know if i've been accepted to the group or not but i think that's a really great idea for being able to help people swap things yeah. rather than buying new or throwing things yeah, away yeah so and... um i guess i'll just kind of mention what it is um since it was a private conversation that we had um so I've been getting a lot of this, um, a lot of stuff for alumni projects recently in what's called a buy nothing group. It's a Facebook group. Um, we have a huge buy nothing community where I am at the moment, which is in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, and so basically it's a, you join, you have to join within, um, it has to be your own neighborhood because the idea is sort of not just recycling and repurposing, but also to get to build a sense of community. So they really want you to join the buy nothing group that's in your neighborhood. Um, and basically people put, um, put, put out asks or gives on this, um, on Facebook. And they say, you know, if you're looking for something, you ask for something specific, or if you're cleaning out your garage and you want to give something away, people post stuff on there all the time. Um, and it's really, really cool to see all the kinds of stuff that people give away, um, or that people ask for and get, um, and get their, you know, wishes given. And I, I, I know it's not just, um, we do have a really good community for that here in St. Paul, but it's not just here because I'm also part of a group in Copenhagen. Um, in Copenhagen, it's called Free Your Stuff. So basically it's a, it's another, um, <laughs> it's less about community building, but it's more about um, just not putting more crap out into the environment. Um, and there's also, so that's more for stuff, but there's also a food sharing group, Copenhagen as well. Um, they, they do a lot of, um, basically trying to prevent waste from grocery shops and restaurants. And there's people that will go around and collect food and then they'll host these big food sharing events where you can come and basically it's like a grocery buffet and you can just like take all this fresh produce. Sometimes they'll cook meals for free so you just come and wait in line and you get to meet wow. a lot of cool people so um it's definitely worth checking out if you have some sort of group like that in your area because it's a really great way to save on money and meet people like like-minded people and save the planet well you know contribute a little bit towards recycling yeah it's just like it's a win-win <laughs> all around that's so cool i definitely know it's a thing because I'm in New Jersey and I know several people who are in their local buy nothing groups and they rave about it about yeah, how cool yeah. it is and the cool stuff they've gotten from it another thing I'm a big fan of is the buy sell groups on Facebook I know it's not free but I just bought something from somebody for the first time I bought an 18th century dress someone was selling second hand and I got a brand new dress it fits my measurements I didn't have to buy a single yard of fabric it just arrived and it's not brand new because it's someone else's that, like, someone else made it. They wore it a few times, didn't want it anymore, and now they've got their materials money back, and I have a new dress, and everyone's happy, and it's really, really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Super good point about the the buy-sell groups. I hadn't even thought about that because, again, super new to historical.
sparkle costuming but that's super cool because then you get to like you it's like feel like a new dress to you even though it's not technically new <laughs> yeah and they've got really specific ones like you can go to the 18th century buy sell group you can go to the regency millinery and accessories buy sell group like you can really find specific things that you're looking for and i've sold a bunch of things that you know, I made a few years ago, they don't fit anymore, I can't wear it, and I can sell it, and now someone else gets something new, I make a little money, like, it's really awesome, and everybody's happy. <laughs> That's cool. Do you guys have a favorite thing you like to mend or alter, or? Uh, my favorite thing to mend or alter is stuff that I already own, because now I don't need anything new, and I can just immediately have the thing to wear again, it doesn't have a hole in it anymore. <laughs> and that's super great and i have things i've held on to for years both in my regular wardrobe and my costume wardrobe that if i didn't mend it it would be long gone but i've mended it many times and it's still here i still love it and wear it all the time i wear things until they literally fall apart and cannot be saved <laughs> and then maybe a little up past that <laughs> <laughs> i think we all at least have one item of clothing like i've got a ratty holy t-shirt that i've just i've had it since I was probably 10 years old and it was big on me then it's big on me now and i still love that t-shirt and it will never die <laughs> uh mm -hmm. i don't i don't think i necessarily have a favorite thing to mend or alter because honestly i kind of find the process mildly annoying most of the time um but it is really enjoyable <laughs> to actually get to like wear it again most because most of the time i kind of like I s try to stop wearing it when I see that there's, you know, a repair needing to be made, but then it kind of sits in a pile of shame for a long time. So when I do finally get around to fixing it or mending it or whatever, and I can wear it again, that's the part that I get really excited about. I'm not really interested. Like, I don't get joy out of the mending process, usually. But I do get a lot of joy out of finally getting to put whatever piece of clothing it is back into like regular rotation. <laughs> what I've started doing with my mending pile is take the thing that needs mending, put it on a hanger, hang it onto the edge of my ironing board when it's folded up. So every time I want to work on something, I have to move it to get to my ironing board. And I think mm, I should really fix this so I can stop doing this. And it really like kicks me into getting stuff done because it gets annoying. And it's that's like been working idea. pretty well. I don't let things sit for six months before fixing them as much. Oh, gosh. My poor men pile is huge right now. For me, it's like the mundane. Like, the, the repair work isn't fun or exciting or pretty and floofy. It's just kind of, a, I don't know, kind of a necessity, something that needs to be done. So it feels like work for me. So I, I think that's a really great idea for helping kind of push yourself. Hey do your chores before you get the reward kind of thing. Yeah, put it somewhere where you can see it so we can just keep giving you the side eye of, like, you didn't fix me yet every time you look at it. <laughs> the shame. Yeah, just let it shame you into fixing it. If that's what it takes, like, I will shame myself into doing my repairs. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite item to recycle? I really love it when we remake when when the designer asks me to restore or remake or refurbish a hat or a reticule or a parasol from stock where it exists it's just not the right trim or the right color or you know we need to recover it with a new fabric i'd love to re restore something like that 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 has already had one or more lives as a certain style, and then we're refashioning it into whatever we need it to be. Absolutely. Uh, what is your favorite or most often kind of recycled material? What is, what is something that you use pretty often and the things that you'd like to do with them? It's, it's pretty basic, and I recommend it to people all the time, sheets. I reuse sheets. I either use them like I would a muslin, or if they have a print, I use them as an actual garment, or I cut them up and use them to stuff things, or, you know, but especially they get stained, they get gross, or they don't, and then you can reuse them for something nice. Um, I've, I've joked around that I need to start, for my personal channel, a, a sheet count for how many costumes right. I've made out of sheets, because the number 
is very high. And so it's, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's, it's a surprisingly simple one because when you think about a sheet, it really is just fabric. Right. And I use it like, and it doesn't matter if it's stained, if it's a lining, if it's just going to be going on the inside, or if you're just using it for a mock-up for that moment, or, you know, I, I, I think it's fantastic. The sheets are So amazing. it's simple. But that's, that's why I do it so often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you can find really cool ones too. Like a lot of the old 50s sheets with all the like prints of flowers and stuff on them, those make like perfect 18th century skirts. Like the, the, the prints and the patterns are so perfect for that. So what is your favorite thing to mend or alter or change in a way that is something that you do often? I repair all of my own clothes. I mean, I, something has to rot off of me pretty much before I get rid of it. <laughs> you know, like patching, mending, darning socks. I do all of that stuff. Um, I would say my least favorite thing is to darn socks. I really hate that, but I still do it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a um, fan either. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I love to, when I, when I have a denim garment, like whether it's jeans or something else, like a jacket, um, and, and it gets a worn hole in it, I love to patch that hole with the, the sort of, industrial patching that was trendy maybe 10 years ago where you sew in one direction zigzag back and forth and so then you nice. sew back the mm -hmm. other way and it becomes this like element it, it it's like the the janky version of sashiko or whatever because it doesn't look sashiko is a beautiful way to patch something and this is like kind of like a mad max way to patch something <laughs> but i still love it Post -apocalyptic. yeah <laughs> we, we so i i learned how to sew working in an alteration shop and we had a man who brought the same pair of jeans to us for like three years straight and at this point, I think there's maybe a whole two square inches of the original jeans <laughs> because we have patched it in so many different ways, so many different times. <laughs> Look cool. I used to do alterations as well. And we had a couple like that where people would just bring in the same things over and over again. And it's really great when people are committed. But there comes a point where I'm like, oh, dear. You didn't get this to me soon enough, and the rip goes from crotch all the way up to your waist. So, we're, we're, I'm gonna say that maybe it's time to call it on this pair, and I'm more than happy to take it as patches for other things if you would like to recycle it in some way. But yeah, that's that's actually that's a good callback to what we were talking about earlier: easy ways to implement it in your life always have to do it yourself could take it to an alterationist and have them repair it for you a lot of people i think don't think about the fact that you can get repair work done right right so you know if it, just because you don't have time to do it yourself doesn't mean you can't do it yeah most most dry cleaner shops will usually uh employ where that's where i worked is at a dry cleaner shop i that's how i was employed um and they never charge very much. Honestly, I think uh, I think a lot of them undervalue the work, and you know because a lot of people won't want to pay eight dollars to have a pair of jeans patched when they could just buy a whole new pair for twenty. So I know that a lot of people won't do that, but I think eight dollars is very reasonable. That's you know for the amount of time that I know I have to put into mending a pair. And of if jeans. you don't have the resources, like if you don't have a sewing machine that's heavy duty enough to process patching jeans you know it, it's it's worth it i actually think i think that's a great point and and i think most people it's not that they don't know about alteration shops or alteration services but it's like they think they're they just exist to hem your pants to the right length and and not that you could take a damaged garment there and have it repaired yes. but that's a great point I think those are the best ones too, because for me, I know when I did alterations, I didn't do a whole lot of 
you know, make this wedding dress bodice fit kind of stuff. Usually that's, you know, that's something I would do for people that I would feel comfortable in my home and like having there and like pinning it together so that I can make sure it fits perfectly for them. But for me, a lot of the work that I did was repairs, you know, especially, you know, where I live, I live in the Midwest and there's a lot of farmers, a lot of uh, workers in factories that wear jeans all the time and don't, they always would tell me, uh, you don't have to make it pretty. I'm like, oh, but I want to. Because I love doing the the, the, um, the freehand embroidery foot on the machine and then just seamlessly making that new patch line up and just making it like like it never even happened. Like there was nothing there. And they'd get it back and they're like, well, you didn't have to go through all that trouble. I'm like, I know I didn't have to. <laughs> I, I, kind of off topic, but since we're talking about it a bit I a good thing to know if you are going to take something in to be repaired the sooner you take it in the better and the better of a product you're going to get back we same thing we get a lot of workers come in and they notice their jeans hem started fraying but they waited until it was completely shredded and so now it's actually going to be too short for you because we have to use that extra space to hem it so if you bring it in right when you start noticing it to going, then we can make it the proper length so you won't step on it without having to come up with some weird solution to make it too short or with an extra patch or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I think another thing to note, too, if you take something in, oh, if I could just unfreeze right now, that'd be great. Okay. If you take something in to be altered, too, um... I know that washing it makes it so that it's more likely to fall apart, but please don't wear your jeans all day at work. Realize there's a rip and then just drop them off at the dry cleaners. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so what is your favorite thing to mend or alter or make new? I feel like fixing fashion is going to be a great one for that. Yes. So I would have to say my favorite thing to alter is to shorten pants because <laughs> yeah like I said I used to work in an alteration shop and I am very short my husband's very short so I have done a lot of pants I can do it in 10 minutes with my eyes closed and my arms behind my back so it's my favorite because it's easy right um but I I don't know I I like to alter things in a way that's conscious of the fact that bodies fluctuate. Mm -hmm. And so if I make something smaller, I like to do the best I possibly can to make sure you can take it out later if you need to. That's mm -hmm. something I've really been keeping an eye on because that also helps the longevity of clothes and, and right. helps you use them longer. Right. I do the same thing like with my, my kiddos' jeans. I I do the, um, the stitching along the hem where... <clears throat> The stitching along the hem where you continue to keep the original hemline, but then you just tuck the excess up and then tack it so that you can let them down lo uh, longer if they do grow, but they're still able to keep the same waist measurement. So that way they're functional for that purpose and they don't get shredded on the bottom being dragged all over the ground, but then they're still able to be let back down when kids invariably grow that Bro. way. <laughs> Or when we inevitably grow this way. Yes. I think quarantines hit a lot of people, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, gosh. So do you, what do you guys feel when someone compliments a recycled item of yours or something that you made out of completely recycled materials or, or using a bunch? And what's that feeling like? It's like that feeling of when someone compliments your dress and you're like, thanks, it has pockets and they like lose their mind over it. Like, it's like that. <laughs> Where you're just like, I made this out of a bed sheet. This dress cost me six dollars. And everyone's like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. <laughs> like everyone gets really excited and it's a lot of fun. And people ask you, like, what thrift store do you go to? I need to come to your thrift store with you. <laughs> it's a lot of fun and I really enjoy it. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's kind of like I need, to go to your <laughs> I need to go to your dumpsters where they have like 30, 30 yard bolts of fabric that someone's just throwing out. That sounds pretty awesome, too. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I have a whole video um, where I called Dumpster Diving Denmark, where I did like okay. a whole week of dumpster diving um, every day. And then at the end of the video, I sort of totaled up all the different things that I had found and like the things that were quantifiable, I quantified. So like how many yards of fabric or how many burn hours I found of candles. It was like some insane amount of like several days straight of burning of candles that I found, Um, you know, or how much money in clothing I found kind of. And it was really crazy to see like how much stuff people throw away. And it's all, it was all perfectly usable. So if you want some good dumpsters, like come to Copenhagen because I know where everything is. It's insane. <laughs> yeah, and I'll link that video down below if you guys want to check it out because oh. that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, wait, what was the question again? <laughs> uh, how do you feel oh, uh, when someone compliments you? I think the feeling I get when someone compliments the recycled materials is, you know, I, I, I get the whole, oh, wow, that looks amazing. How did you make it? But I'm like, oh, sit down and wait until I tell you what I made that out of. You will never believe me. <laughs> and I, I think it, it definitely helps inspire people, too, because I know there's been a couple of people that have really been asking a lot of questions about how the process works and the way I do things it takes a lot of time and I know a lot of people don't have that or are able to give that amount of time but for me it's kind of worth it to be able to just put my time and pour my effort into something rather than buying new materials that I didn't need so you know it's not for everybody but I think that there's something to be said for the validation that comes with that where it's like Thank you for noticing because I worked so hard on that. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like it's kind of like the pride you feel when someone compliments you on something you've made anyway, but it's like an extra notch because it's like you went the extra mile because it is almost always more work to recycle materials, you know, like it, trying to piece things together or, you know, process the plastic into a usable form. Like it's always an extra step. So it's like so much extra work that people don't always see. So it's really nice. It's like you get that compliment and that feel good feeling of, yes, I made it. But then you get like this extra boost of like getting to sort of explain like the whole creative process behind it and like how this was garbage two weeks ago and now you're complimenting me on it. People are always so mind blown. Like, how did you get from here to there? Like, how did you do that? And, like, it's and not photos. complicated. It just takes some time. <laughs> I, I say it frequently on my channel um, that you're able to do the same thing. It just takes a little bit of time, a lot of patience, and not being afraid to dumpster dive once in a while. So, I, I enjoy it. I think that is kind of a good point to touch on, though, that, like, it is sort of, it's not as accessible, for sure, because, like, if you don't have that time to devote to it, 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 it be careful not to, like, knock fast fashion in terms of, like, yeah, thrifting is awesome if you have the time to, like, go and shop around, but, like, sometimes you just need to go get that replacement shirt or like you were saying those five dollar walmart t-shirts like sometimes you just gotta do it and like there's nothing wrong with that but if you have the time to go that extra step and or if you're really passionate about recycling i think it's definitely like it has its benefits and it's can be really fun to do <laughs> okay so this question just kind of is asking the feeling that you get when someone compliments an item that you made out of recycled materials? It's very gratifying. Um, especially when I reveal that it, it used to be something else and they're just incredulous. You know, I, I think the most recent example I can think of was I, I made this Regency bonnet of straw braid that had been re it had existed as a hat before that then became I took that excuse me I took that hat apart 
or no, somebody donated the braid that they had just salvaged from another hat. Um, they gave it to me just because, um, and I was able to make that into this new Regency bonnet. And I donated it to um, here at the university where I work is um, there's a group that a group of academics who host an event called the Jane Austen Summer Program, which is scholarship pertaining to the Regency era. But there's a certain amount of people who like to dress up in costumes and have a picnic and, and so forth. And they do um, one component of the programming of that is theatricals. And so I donated this bonnet to them, like whether somebody was going to wear it just walking around as part of the event or use it in the theatricals. And the woman I gave it to was just speechless when I told her that it, it had been a crappy sun hat in a previous life that probably came from Target. <laughs> now it, this is what it was. Absolutely. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I think the feelings with that just, they're so gratifying, especially when you tell people, they're like, wow, that looks so cool. And I'm like, oh, bet you didn't know what it was made of. Probably <laughs> when you're able to, to reuse and or upcycle something that, you know, if you, if you have a picture and can show someone, like, this is what it was before I completely refashioned it and and they're just amazed that something perhaps was fairly pedestrian and now it's it's so much more impressive i guess that's always a gratifying feeling yeah that's that's definitely a good feeling so how do you feel when people compliment an item that you've recycled uh, i don't know if you talked enough about that when rachel is here or not so it's, it's for me, at least, it's that same feeling of when somebody is like, hey, I like your dress. And you're like, oh, thanks. It has pockets. Like, it's, yeah. it's that feeling. It's, oh, thanks. I bet you didn't know. Here's the secret thing about it that will wow you. You know, like, it's, it's, it's very much that feeling. Oh, that's so funny. In the, la in the last one I did, someone said the exact same thing. It's the exact feeling of it has pockets. Mm -hmm. That's it's It's universal. Mm -hmm. Casey is Envy's cosplay. I also wanted to be a part of this. The scheduling, scheduling was a little difficult. Here are some things that she used for from recycled, recycled material. I love rocket ship. Thank you all for watching. Make sure to check the description for your badge. Thanks. Bye. So thank you guys so much for joining and I really had a great time gaining your perspectives and learning about everything. So I appreciate it so much. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Links to their channels down below. <laughs> well, thank you guys so, so much for participating and for sharing your experiences and your thoughts. Both of their channels will be linked below and we also did another collaboration on fixing fashion. The Like we were just saying, the goal isn't to shame people out of using fast fashion, but to give people the tools to be able to repair or alter or mend other things that are in your closet that might not be historical costumes, but just some kind of simple things that if you're new to sewing or new to coming up with creative ideas for how to mend or alter your clothing, the link for that will be down below as well. So thank you guys so, so much for participating, and I had so much fun with this. Thank you. Bye. Yay. <laughs> I'll talk okay. to you guys soon. <laughs> <laughs>